the year is off and running, and um, I got some news for you. All right, you ready for some news? Um, <clears throat> life is not going to slow down for you. Sad news, right? Life is not going to slow down for you. It's not going to slow down for me. Um, it's not going to get any easier, all right? But um, the good news, the good news is we can do something about that. We can do something about the fact that life is just keeps on flying by on, um, you know, on, uh, on the bullet, right? Um, life is just going to keep on moving. And, and that's okay. I want you to be, with, be okay with the fact that life is going to keep on moving forward. There's no way you can press pause. You can't press stop on life. You can't devo life and come back to it. It's one of the reasons why some of us are preoccupied I'm going to build a little bit on what I talked about Sunday. Raise your hand if you were here Sunday. If you were not here Sunday, go on Facebook, watch the message from Sunday, okay? I'm building on to that message, and, and it, was a, it, was a, it was an awesome message. It was, it was a, a great word of God um, for the people, and um, I'm going to build on that message, and that message was simply, don't worry. Don't be gripped by fear. Don't be gripped by worry. Don't let preoccupation slow you down and on what God is calling you to do or leading you or me to do. So I'm going to build on to that. And, um, and I'm, I'm here to remind us that life is not going to slow down for us. Matter of fact, it's only going to speed up. It's only going to speed up. Um, and, and, and let me get back to that thought, where, with, um, which I started. Um, Life, okay, has gotten to the point in some ways where we don't want to miss anything that happens. We don't want to miss a post on Facebook. We don't want to miss somebody's post on Twitter. We don't want to miss somebody's post on Instagram. If we missed it, it's like, oh my gosh. If you didn't get a chance to like it, it's like, oh my gosh. If you missed the episode, oh my goodness, you got to catch up and get that last episode. I mean, life is turning, turning, <laughs> Moonies, are you laughing back there, Moonies? Life is turning into that kind of thing where we have become so preoccupied by the things that we miss that we tend to place too much of an emphasis on the things, watch this, that don't really matter. We place way too much of an emphasis on the things that are good for other people and good for you, but don't change my life one way or the other. Can I get an amen? amen. And so that's what I want to talk about tonight. So tonight, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take it back to the old school. Toe tapping and No, I'm kidding. We're going to take it back to the old school a little bit, and we're going to do... Um, what coaches like to call fundamentals. Turn to your neighbor and say, we're going to have some fundamentals tonight. Turn to your other neighbor, your second choice, and tell them we're going to go through some fundamentals tonight. That's messed up, you second choices. Should have been, should have been the first choice, right? <clears throat> So we're going to go back to fundamentals. We're going to go back to some basics, some very, very simple building blocks of life. Not just any life, but the life of a believer. We're going to talk about three things. Somebody say three things. Okay, these three things. We're going to talk about prayer. Someone say prayer. The second thing we're going to talk about tonight is the Word of God. Somebody say the Word of God. And the third thing we're going to talk about tonight is family. Give it up. Give God, give God some praise. We're going to talk about three basic building blocks of the faith. Three fundamentals of our faith. Prayer, the Word of God, and family. And I, and I, want, I, want, to, I want to remind you, it don't matter if you miss a post. 
on Facebook. It'll be okay. It don't matter if you miss any Instagram post. It will be okay, I promise. You could turn your phones off right now, promise. Nothing will, will affect you, will hurt you if you turn your, your social media off right now. They'll all be there when we get out of church. And I'm stressing that point to remind us that um, life is too fast for us to keep up with anyway. If you have children, you're not going to all of a sudden start doing less activities. You're not all of a sudden going to say, you know what, son, um, you're not, not, we're not putting you in sports this year just because life is just way too fast. It's out of control. You know, so you're just going to stay at home in your room and just chill in the living room all year. You're not going to do that because you're looking for, for things so that you can enrich the lives, the lives of your, your young people. You're, gonna, you're looking for things that are going to enrich your life. Like Pastor Danny said, when you're looking at this year in review video, you see all the wonderful activities that Mission Ebenezer has. And guess what? They, they do enrich our lives. Okay? Life is not going to slow down for any one of us. Um, but it's going to be okay. So the thing that needs to change in our mind, in our lives, is our mindset, our mentality, the way we look at things. If we're if, if we're constantly bogged down, if we're on if we're just on social media all the time, if we're constantly text messaging and doing all these things all the time, guess what? You're probably preoccupied with things that don't even matter, shouldn't matter, especially when. There's other things that we could really be focusing on, like prayer, like the word of God, and like things involving family. Right? Especially when uh, husbands and wives need to be having good, healthy conversations at home. And your wife's looking at you saying, so you're going to put that thing down or what? Or your, your, or your, uh, your, your husband's saying, so you're going you're gonna to turn that thing off or what? You're like watching TV, like all the episodes. We need to talk. Most of the time, that's the ladies. That's the, they're, they're getting on us, guys. Turn the game off. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to start out with a little story. Um, <clears throat> when I got drafted out of high school by the Oakland A's, I turned down an offer that they had given to me. They offered me some money to play some ball, Chris. But on the other hand, I had a scholarship to go to the University of Florida. Get away from home, David. He's like, I can't wait till I'm 18. <laughs> but all in good things. So I go to the University of Florida, and I remember vividly, like, it, like if it was yesterday, I remember getting into the batter's box thinking, I'm going to show these guys what us Cali boys are all about. I remember getting in there kind of like a, a, you know, a Babe Ruth scene, you know, just hitting my cleats and like show these guys what's up. I got into my batter's, the batter's box. Sure enough, there was that pitcher, big dude, 6'6", six, six, throwing 97 miles an hour. I'm in the batter's box. I'm right here. I'm getting my groove. And then all of a sudden, the pitch, boom, strike one. I was like, ah, that was nothing. I'll catch up to that sucker. Next pitch, I get back in there. Boom, strike two. I'm like, whoa, that was a little fast. <laughs> and then sure enough, the next pitch was a slider in the dirt. Whoosh, there I go, swinging that junk. Walked right back to the dugout. I'm like, whew, that was harder than I thought. <laughs> Sat back down, put my helmet in the dugout, or in the little cubby. And I remember thinking to myself, this game is way faster than it was in high school. I mean, only three months had, had passed by from high school to college. And then all of a sudden now, I am, I'm, I'm in a different world. I'm in a different level. And I can't keep up with the game. It's way too fast for me. And in sports, there's this thing where they say that the great athletes are the ones that are able to slow the game down. The, the, the all-stars, the, the phenom athletes, whether you're 18 years old and you're, you're cracking into the NBA at 18 years old, or if you're 22 and you're going to the major leagues, the greats somehow know how to slow the game down to where it looks like a big watermelon's coming at them and they, they can hit every single pitch. Or they could, they could compete at any level 
of athletics. And I want to take this sports metaphor, if you will allow me, and I want to have us apply it to life. You see, for some of us, life has already become too fast. For some of us, life has already become the kind of thing that it is difficult for us to keep up with. And so the thing that I believe God is calling us back to, the thing that's going to help us slow the game down so that life is manageable, so that relationships are manageable, so that the pace of life is manageable, is having a healthy, consistent prayer life, having a healthy daily routine of being in God's Word, and having a healthy and wholesome family life. If you do these three things, life is going to slow way down. If we do these things, if you reestablish and reconnect and, and create a healthy prayer life with God, where you're inviting the Holy Spirit into your life, you're turning everything off. You're creating, let's say, 30 minutes a day to prayer you will be amazed at the wonders that 30 minutes with God can do for your life. And I, I know that because I've done it before. And I need to be consistent with it, like what I'm talking about over here. But I've, I've, I've seen and experienced where I've carved out that time during my busy day, you got to find it. It's not going to pop up. It's not going to show itself to you. You have to create it. You have to be intentional. You may have to pop it in on an on alert on your calendar, on your phone, to remind you to get down on your knees and pray. You may have to make a note on, your, on all of your smart devices to remind you to set that time aside to pray in the middle of your day. In, your, in the morning or even at night. That's how important a prayer life is. Um, <clears throat> this is what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5.16. He says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But I want us to focus on that second Phrase, part B, he says, pray without ceasing. That's also meaning a kind of meditation that we're constantly thinking on the things of God. We're constantly washing our mind with godly thoughts throughout the day, only interrupted by work, by play, by love. Are you guys following me? A renewed commitment to a, a healthy prayer life will bring a whole lot of good into our lives. But we have to be intentional about it. It's not going to happen on its own, moms. Ladies, can I hear an amen? It will not happen all by itself. It, it just won't. Satan don't want it to happen in your life. Shoot, even sometimes we even move it out of the way on purpose. Sometimes we remove it and say, oh, we ignore it. We ignore the alarm. We ignore the alert. Say, oh, you know, I'll do that later. No, we got to be intentional about it. Um, let, me, let me remind us of some things. In a world full of trouble, discord, blurred lines, we must trust in the Holy Spirit to give us, number one, direction, number two, discernment, and number three, durability. Direction, where to go discernment, what should we think about certain things? Because how many of you know we have to think about what we do and how we do things? And the next thing is durability. Our, our prayer life will affect our thought life, and it'll give us the strength that we need to persevere, to be durable, to make it through our day, maybe at work, with hot heads, to make it through our work, maybe with a bunch of folks that don't want to be there, but hey, you're there with them. They ain't going anywhere. You ain't going anywhere.
Pray without ceasing. Let us look at the life of Jesus, the example that our Lord Jesus gave to us in three different situations. We really need to seek the Lord, watch this, also in special circumstances, just like Jesus. Number one, how about the time of preparation? The time of preparation that Jesus carved out, set aside so that he would get ready to go into ministry. That time of preparedness was the time that he spent in the wilderness. What did he do in the wilderness? He prayed. He prayed. Whenever you're going into a time, a new season, there must come a time of prayer and preparation that you must journal, you must write, you must make mental notes. We must spend time in our word, in the word of God, maybe even during those times of prayer and preparation. Amen? Amen. Jesus was preparing for the fight of his life, the battle of his life. He was going to stand toe-to-toe against Satan himself and be tempted by life, by, 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 by letdowns, by discouragements, by by failures, by our own mistakes. We got we to gotta stand square in the face and look them in the mirror at our own failures, our own mistakes, our own letdowns. But we have, to, we have to make sure that we've spent time in prayer preparing us for those moments. It's super important. If Jesus did it, why shouldn't we? The next thing is the time that Jesus spent in the garden. What was he doing in the garden? Huh? Praying. And what kind of time or what kind of season was this for Jesus? It was a time of transition. Somebody say transition. He was transitioning into his next promotion. Jesus was about to get promoted again. He was transitioning. He needed to press into God. So he created. Somebody say created. He created once again. He had to go and create a retreat for himself to pray. He went there with his disciples, but of course, they couldn't keep up with Jesus. They couldn't keep up with our Lord. He was a praying machine. He was a prayer warrior, as we say. Amen. Jesus had calluses on his knees. He was in the garden. Praying through a time of transition. He prayed unto the Father. He glorified the Father with his life. Jesus not only prayed for himself, he prayed for his disciples, and then he prayed for us. He was interceding. Somebody say interceding. Isn't that another great point? We have to be intentional about creating time so that we can do The work of God so that we can do the work that he's called us to do in interceding for the world. You better pray for yourself. You better pray for your your spouse. You better pray for your children. You better pray for your family. You better pray for your loved ones by name that don't know Jesus. You better pray for your, your parents. Pray for your grandparents. Pray for good health. It was a time of transition. But Jesus didn't only pray for himself, he prayed for others. He was interceding. There's an area, there, here's an area of prayer that we have somewhat neglected in the church. Here's a prayer, in, here, here's, here's a kind of prayer that we have, we have kind of moved over to the side and we only kind of pick and choose the times that we, we begin to intercede. But we must enter into a new season of intercessory prayer. We must build up the faith muscle of prayer and learning to pray for others as unselfish as that is. Oh, but I have a whole bunch of things that I haven't listed and haven't prayed for yet. That's okay. Move on from that. God will take care of you. Start praying for her. Start praying for him. Start praying for them. The next is pray when you're in a time of crisis. 
Pray when you're in crisis. When you find yourself in behind prison, prison bars and you're like, how did I get here, Lord? Don't fall into a place of guilt. Don't fall into a place of beating yourself up. You ain't going to do yourself no good. Get on your knees and pray. Crisis. God wants you to call upon him when you're in crisis, even if it was your own doing that brought you to the point of crisis. He hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't forgotten about me. Give God a hand clap. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap. Give me a chance to drink some water. What did Jesus say when he was on the cross? When he was in a point of crisis? He said, it says in verse 34, Mark 15, And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was in a point of crisis. But what did he do? Did he, did he just complain about it? Did he, did he feel sorry for himself? No, but he cried out to God. He cried out to God. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. The second thing that we need to do when it comes back to fundamentals is read the word of God. Stay in God's word. My dad used to have this thing way back in the day. I remember it um, even today. It was called jam on it. Everybody say jam on it. Everybody, does anybody know what jam on it? Anybody remember what jam on it means? What does it mean, guys? Pastor Danny? Just a minute. If we all just spent even just a minute a day in God's word, it would change our lives. That's how potent it is. It's like concentrated. It's concentrated. You know when you're making that big red punch for the birthday party and you pour in that concentrate? Imagine the word of God is just, all you need is a drop. Jesus turns water into wine. The word of God is so powerful, it's so potent, it could change your circumstance right there. Boom. Wisdom. Counsel. Words God is so amazing, it's so powerful, it's so, so true. I got a few things I'd like to get through right now. If you aren't taking notes, it's okay, you can get these later. The word of God, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. How many of us have ever made the excuse, oh, well, you know what? I just don't know the, the Bible that very well. What are we doing about that then? Oh, you know what? I just don't understand the Bible. Sit down, open the Bible, pray and ask the Holy Spirit to fill your mind, fill your heart, fill your life. Give you the thoughts that he wants you to have. Give you the understanding that he's going to give you. And set aside the time that it takes to think about the things of God that he's written in his word. The book of love, the book of life. Amen. Right? All we, all we got to do is just take the time to go ahead and enter into that time and enter into that space. But it starts with you and me making the time. I mean, we're in the beginning of the year and everybody's talking about, I'm going to start the new year off right. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to, you already broke your resolutions already. You don't, don't even have to admit it. All right, everybody turn to your neighbor and tell them that you're, no, I'm just kidding. The first thing, according to the word of God, is wisdom. Somebody say wisdom. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. We believe that the word of God is when God speaks to us. He speaks to our lives through his word. And his word is a living word. It is not dead. It's alive. And when we open up God's word and give God a chance, his word will speak into the depths of our heart, into the depths of our, our soul. Yeah, it, it will. And he'll give you wisdom. The second thing is discipleship. And this simply means he's going to help us retrain our mind. 
He's going to help us rethink the way we used to think. Before we used to think the ways of the streets, before we used to think the way the people did in the world, before we used to think, oh, let me just get mine, before we used to think like this, we used to think like that, then the word begins to wash over us. The word begins to just wash our mind, wash our heart, and all of a sudden, the desires that you once used to have are no longer there. Now you're like, oh, you know what? This lady, she needs to cut me in line. She must be in a rush. Hey, go ahead. You know, I ain't going to lose my salvation over that. And the word of God, the retraining of our mind, allows us to be the person that God really wants us to be. Right? Bigger than that. Thank God for <clears throat> helping retrain the mind. It says, in, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Transformed means becoming a completely new thing. By the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So that by you learning God's word and allowing God's word to wash over your mind and over your life, you become God's gift to others. You become a blessing in the world. You learn how to serve others instead of take from others. Amen? Amen. The next thing is the word is power. The word of God is power. According to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 it says, For the word of God is alive and is active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's power. Power. That's when the word of God convicts us in our spirit when we're starting to veer off track. When we're starting to let our thoughts wander. When we're trying to make judgments of right versus wrong, the word of God comes in. According to Psalm chapter 119, he says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my what? My path. It is power and it's strength. God's word. Number four, God's word is also security and confidence. According to Psalm chapter 18, verse 30, which says, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. I'd like to say that there's great comfort in knowing God's word. There's great comfort in being able to hold on to God's word like a rock on the edge of a cliff. There's great comfort in knowing that you're standing upon a rock, which is the word of God and his promises and his truths. Security. It says that he shields all who take refuge in him. Take cover under the word of God. I hope we're getting all these. The next thing is this. God's word is right and it's true. And don't let anybody tell you different. Don't let Satan lie to you. Don't let, don't let, don't let Satan discourage us. Let's not, let, let's not let Satan come in and get in between our relationships. Let's not let Satan get in between you and I coming to church. Let's not let Satan come between you and I and our calling. Let's not let Satan get in between you and I and our purpose. Psalm 33, 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. He is right and he's true and he's faithful in all he does. You know what that means? He's faithful in what he's doing in your life. He is the author. He's the finisher of our faith. The work that he has begun in us, he will see it to its end because he's faithful. But 
We have to be rooted in a life of prayer, saturated, bathed in, surrounded by time spent in His Word. Amen? And the third point was that we make family a priority. And family could be defined in a variety of different ways and different things. It could be your biological family that God wants you to continue to press into. It could be your family of faith here at, the, here at church, the body of Christ. You, you may not have any family around, but God will provide family right there where you're at. That will encourage you and won't talk you down. Won't push you down so they could get up. Family is there. The Bible says that there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother in many cases. And we all need that. Focus on family this year. Restoring the fabric, the very fabric of family within our society is important as well. Dads, I'm going to talk to you for a second. Is that okay? All right, all you dads that are here. Helping us focus on our families in one aspect is providing. 1 Timothy 5.8 says, But if anybody provide not for his own, and specifically for his own house, He has denied his faith and is worse than an infidel. A Christian who does not provide for his family, it says that he's worse than an unbeliever. Paul is underlining, when he's writing to Timothy, the importance. And it doesn't just say men, but I'm addressing it to men, and I'll say women too, because it's the... Combined calling that we have, especially living in Los Angeles, where the cost of living is like way up here. Sometimes it takes two incomes. But before you go and start saving the world, focus on your family first. Establish that priority, that order. The second thing regarding family is leading. Somebody say leading. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 says, <clears throat> But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Here Paul gives us this metaphor, and he gives us this, this kind of sequence or order of, of care, within the family and it's again placing the responsibility on men to lead their families but let's face it in some families sometimes the husbands aren't saved women that's okay continue to lead your family boldly continue to be a spiritual leader for your family it doesn't mean you become the head over your family if you're still married and your husband's not a believer he continues to be the head of your family but you continue to love and respect your husband. The next is be present. Being present can go a long way. Can go a very long way. In Exodus chapter 18, verses 2 and 3. Anybody remember the story of Moses and his father-in-law Jethro? Moses was so busy. He was so tied up at work. Fixing everyone's problems. Making sure that he gave everything that he had away to others. Giving up his very best to work. And leaving only leftovers for his family. Right? It reminds me of like a barbecue that I did one day. I did steak. I did 
burgers. I did hot dogs. I did everything. My wife, she was busy. She was moving around. She was being so hospitable to everyone. She was making sure that everybody was taken care of. She made sure everybody got food. I mean, it was like by the time the barbecue was over, she had not even eaten yet. She was like, okay, finally I get a chance to sit down and eat. She's like, Josh, you, can you bring me some of that steak? I'm like, steak's all gone. She's like, oh, can I get a burger? I'm like, the burgers are all gone, baby. She's like, I don't want no weenies. <laughs> I was like, dang. Straight gave her the leftovers. You know what I'm saying? And that's what Moses did. So this is what Jeff, Jethro, this is what Jethro, this is what Jethro said to Moses. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, which is Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, Moses had sent his wife to go live with her dad because he didn't have any time for her. He said, you better, I'll, better, you'll be well, better taken care of over there with your dad because I ain't got time for you. That's what Moses said, essentially. Can you imagine what she felt like? She felt like a weenie, didn't she? <laughs> After he had sent her back and her two sons. It'd be like if I told Boomy, Boomy, you might as well just for the next three months just go live with your mom over in Lakewood with Elisha and Judith and the baby. I'll see you in three months. I'm, I'm just... I'm up to here and work, baby girl. That wouldn't fly with Boomy. You guys know that one. <laughs> it wouldn't fly with Boomy. So what is the conclusion of the matter? Be present. Take an active interest in your loved ones around you. Husbands, care for your wives. Love your wives. W wives, love your husbands. Care for your husbands. Care for the children together. Look out for others. Look out for your, your extended family. This is a great, a great time of the year to reestablish some priorities. Somebody say priorities, because I believe priority is what we're getting at today. So three major things we talked about, we considered today, is reestablishing a connectedness and a life of prayer with, with the Lord. Spending time in God's word, even for just a minute, jam on it. And then... Serving the Lord with your family. Letting them know that they're a priority. God's number one. But make sure that God's in everything else. <music>